tell them your song number. Tell them first verse. So you'll say number 523, first verse. Okay, you meet you. Are we on? We're not on here. Are we on now? Okay. I'd like to welcome you to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, we're going to get started with our first song. Uh, Ren is going to lead us in that first song. He's going to tell you the song number. I'll be singing number 523, I know the Lord found a way. 523, I know the Lord found a way for me. First verse only. I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven, I think number 920, yeah, 924 is going to be the song of uh, encouragement following the invitation that's going to be given by Jonathan. Uh, Doris, if you will, let us some prayer and then we'll do this, okay? Let us bow together. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for all the many blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us. We're so very thankful for this time that we have to assemble together to worship thee in spirit and in truth. And we pray that everything that we do and say here would be in accordance with our will. We're so very thankful for all the things that thou hast done for us. We're so thankful that we can look to thee as our Father, and we can look to our brothers and sisters about. We can look to the sacrifice that was made there on the cross of Calvary so that the church might be established. We might uh, have a plan of salvation. And we pray that everything that we do and say at all times would be in accordance with our will. We ask thee to bless us, strengthen us, and help us to stand without fear in doing the things that thou would have us to do. We pray that thou would be with all those who are sick. We pray that thou would help them that they might receive the care that they need. We especially pray for those of our numbers who are, are sick, and we pray that Thou would help them to receive the medical attention, the medical care that they need. We pray that Thou would help us, that we might do the things that are needed that would be beneficial to ourselves and would be very helpful to others also. We pray that Thou would be with us, uh, the Godsey family, as they have moved here with us, we're so thankful for them, and we pray that Thou would be with them, be with us, and help us all to be uh, strong and doing Thy will at all times. We pray that Thou would be with the elders of this congregation. We ask Thee to be with them and help them that they might have the strength and the courage to always stand for the things. Pray that Thou would guide them and help them to uh, lead in the right direction. Help them to always things that Thou has uh, appointed for elders to do and help them that they might do it in a manner that would be well-pleasing at all times. We ask thee that thou...
deacons as they work with the congregation here. We pray that thou would be with them. Help them in the jobs that they have been assigned. Help them in the things that they are striving to do. And we pray that all things that they are doing would be in accordance with thy will. We are very thankful for Brother Philip and his family. We pray that thou would be with the family. Be with them always. Help them to be strong. Help them to be good leaders and good examples at all times. We ask thee to be with each one of us. Guide us as we go from day to day. Be with us as we go to our places of work, as we go to school, as we go to whatever things that we might need to do each day. Help us at all times to be strong, faithful Christians, for we ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You're visiting with us tonight. We're certainly glad that uh, you've decided to come and uh, enjoy a period of Bible study with us. We do have uh, services on Sunday morning uh, beginning at um, 9.30. We have Bible class and then we have a service at 10.15 and normally we have a service at 5 o'clock. We want to continue to pray for Michelle, um, baby's due pretty much any time now, so I know they're excited about that. Uh, let's uh, remember Roy Lee and Phyllis Lindsay at home and Denise Faulkner and Jerry Cooper. And remember George Thompson, he's uh, had a pretty rough time. You know, he's had a rough time with his back for, uh, for a very long time, and uh, he had a kidney stone that they went in and had, did surgery on, I think it was yesterday, had to take him back to the uh, hospital today. So I uh, don't have any more information. I don't know if anybody else does or not, but that's, that's the most recent information I've had. So let's uh, remember George and Jennifer at this time. Uh, the January the 9th is ladies' morning class that will begin at 10 o'clock. And then on the 10th is the Shepherd's Daughters class. They'll meet at 6 o'clock at our house, at Jennifer's house. Um, and Jill is teaching that class. It's lesson four. There's a men's day coming up January 28th. Kurt Brothers is the speaker there. And then on the 29th, uh, we'll have a fellowship meal after our morning service. But then we'll have a regular service at 5 o'clock. Uh, we host the area-wide youth devotional at 5. Uh, Jonathan will be preaching, but we'll have a good number of visitors uh, that evening. Also, remember, or let me uh, tell you, that February the 19th, we'll begin a gospel meeting. we go through the 22nd, and uh, Brother Glenn Colley will be our speaker during that time. Uh, again, the ladies' retreat, if you haven't talked to Ginger or haven't signed up and you want to go, it's going to be sometime uh, in April, but she needs to know that number pretty quick. <clears throat> and I was asked to uh, ask you if you have a listening device, if you'll uh, take it upstairs. That's all I know. All right, invitation songs number 924. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 25. John chapter 3, verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, with who, uh, he who was with you before the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has been the bride, uh, who has the bride, is the bridegroom, but a friend of the bridegroom. 
who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. Here, John the Baptist has, has been doing his ministry for years. And then after he's done this, he's baptized Jesus. Jesus comes along and his disciples begin to notice that John's disciples are leaving John in droves and going towards Jesus. And they say, is this thing right? And they, he says, you guys have missed the point. Yeah, I must decrease that he can increase. Uh, I get to do these illustrations because you haven't seen them before. This is petrified wood, petrified wood, okay? Uh, it was actually Madison's mama, and she taught, uh, she taught science, and I got it uh, when she passed away. But petrified wood, it's heavy because it is a rock, okay? It is a rock, and it's a fossil, essentially. During the petrification process, what happens is all the surrounding materials get washed into that, into that previous material of wood, and slowly, as the wood rots away and new material fills and crystallizes the previous substance, it leaves behind this fossil. It looks like wood. It's the same color. It's very similar. You might mistake it for that if you were to walk by. But what this is is the sediment surrounded that wood is now filled the substance in. Literally, it has decreased, the wood has, so that the rock around it can increase. It slowly over time crystallized till there is nothing left of the original substance and only the rock is the thing that's left behind. Christians go through a similar process. But we don't call it purification or uh, uh, petrification, though the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We go through something called sanctification. And slowly over time, as you walk in Jesus Christ and as you go through different battles in the faith, you become less so that he can become more. And then if you live in the faith long enough, there will be none of you left and only Jesus will remain and he will be the one that walks and lives through you. Become less of me and more of him. You become sanctified. If tonight you would like to become a Christian, to place him first and make him the thing you strive to be, Lord, make me more like the Christ then do that and be baptized just as he was as we stand and as we sing. Just as I am without one plea that that thy blood was shed for
Randy Gray now come lead us in a prayer before we are. Let us pray. Most righteous Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful day we've had to enjoy. A day that you created for us to get out and do the things we need to do as Christians. We thank thee, Lord, for your love for us, for sending your son, Jesus, to live the perfect life on this earth for us to follow, and his willingness to die on the cross and shed his blood for our sins, the great sacrifice. Father, we know you're always with us throughout our lives. You're always present with us to cover our needs in time of trouble, time of pain, and time of sorrow. Time of sickness, Father, we can always call on thee as we try to live as you would have us live. And you're there to support us, and you're always in control, Father. We're just so thankful that we have the avenue of prayer to talk to thee and plead with thee for our needs and to help us to be stronger in the faith and give us encouragement to do more in the service to thee. I thank thee, Lord, for the church here. As we start this new year, we will pray that each one of us in our roles is Elders, deacons, ministers, teachers, just servants of thine, Father. Help us all work together with unity and brotherly love to grow the church here, that we may reach out throughout this community and all throughout the area to encourage others that's not going to church, have not accepted you as their Savior, that we can reach them, reach their hearts, that they may obey the gospel before it's too late. Father, I just pray now as we go to our Bible classes, be with the teachers and each one that's prepared the lessons, Help us stay focused on the thought of the night and do the things, take into our hearts to do the things that will help us be better Christians tomorrow than we were today. Forgive us of our shortcomings, Lord. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Kings and kingdoms will bow down, and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of yeah, Judah. Yeah, there we go. All He's right. All right. With power. There we go. Uh, Brother Philip came and told me that uh, George was able to come home. So that's awesome. So everybody that's been praying for George, uh, keep him coming. So that's awesome. I know it has not been fun for him at all. All right. So tonight's class is going to involve you talking to me because if you don't, it's going to be it's going to be awkward. It's going to be weird. So you've got to talk to me, and that's all right because we're in Bible class, anyways. Uh, here's what I want to know. We're going to get back to the series that you've been doing on Wednesday nights with Brother Philip next week. We're just going to go right back into that book until the next quarter. But this week I wanted to do something different because I want to talk with you. I want to converse with you a little bit um, more. I want you to tell me, um, do you have for yourself or have you for your children 
put any rules in place, any guidelines in place for how you use social media or how you communicate on social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or Snapchat or any of those places. Have you imposed any rules upon yourself? Maybe you've even done it subconsciously, but you know what? Now that you talk about guidelines, there are a couple of things that I do. Or have you with your children put any guidelines in place? Any comments? I have one guideline on myself. I don't do Facebook. That's my wife's business. He says, I don't do it. Now, here, here's what's interesting, though. So a lot of you won't have, and a lot of you are like, oh, this class does not matter to me. Why is he bringing it up? Here's something I do want you to know. Uh, the etiquette that we use to converse with one another on social media is the same etiquette you should be applying to yourself anywhere that you are speaking and conversing, right? Um, so look with me real quick to the book of James chapter 3. And we'll go back to that previous question in a minute. James chapter 3, we'll start in verse 4. Look at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so the thumb, I mean the tongue, uh, is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest, a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among all our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is itself set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast, of bird, of reptile, of creature, of sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Is the tongue the issue? Is the tongue the issue? Well, yeah, physically, yes, it is. But could chapter 3 and the verses that we just read, could that be a sin that's committed by somebody who is mute? Yeah, it could. How could it be done? Because when he says tongue, he's talking about the thing that controls the tongue, isn't he? It's the mind. The mind, uh, you know, out, out of the heart flows all of these things. We're like this wellspring, you know, and, and one of the plays that we let out that venom is through the tongue, but it doesn't have to be, does it? So in social media or in the things that we send, whatever that we send, whatever that we type, maybe the thing that steers the body, maybe the thing that burns itself up and is set on fire by hell, isn't the tongue, but is the thumb. And for a lot of us, it has been. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you've noticed this, but sometimes people who would never in a million years say something to you like this passage describes, they would never in a million years say it. But would they type it to you? Yeah. Yeah, they will. They will. And what's really hurtful, boy, I remember at a, I heard a, a minister, it was an elder talking to a congregation one time. And he pulled out one of his lessons. He started reading posts that he found on Facebook. And they were putrid. I mean, they were bad and mean toward other people, one after one after one after one. And at the end, the elder did something the preacher cannot because they can fire me, but they can't the elder. So this is what he did. That was funny, guys. You can laugh at me some. Uh, he said, what's really bad is that every one of the posts that I just read are from by people that attend worship right here. Oh, oh, oh. You want to talk about bad? Now, that was an elder concerned about people that he was worshiping with. And what's really scary is there were some people there that started to squirm when they heard theirs read because they knew that they had done it, right? And, 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 and it is, it's frustrating when you see brothers and sisters in Christ do this. So, all right, back up. Now, we're going to go back to that question again. Do you have guidelines that you've put in place? We'll start with it like this. For yourself, when you use media of communication of any kind, when you post, do you have any guidelines in place for yourself? Yes, what are they? And never get involved in anything controversial. Okay. 
Don't, if, if you, and Paul talks about this too, right? So long as it depends on you, be at peace with other people. Now, why would that teaching fly out the window? Because I've got on social media. And yet, oftentimes, Christians do it. Um, what other guidelines do you put in place? Hey, if it's controversial, I try not to put my nose in it. What else? It's an excellent one, by the way. Yes, ma'am. Miss Lisa, right? Right. That's right. Uh, it's a thing. That's right. If it's a personal thing, you like to keep it to yourself. Sometimes, and you need to respect the, uh, the courtesies of other people, right? There was somebody who said, uh, I was preaching one time and I told everybody to uh, pray for them because they're traveling. Well, I've never had to think about this before. We started streaming our services during the pandemic. And guess what I told the entire world? His house is available to be robbed. That's what he heard. He didn't hear pray for him because he's traveling. He heard rob his house, right? And so we need to be careful about the information we share about others. So maybe one of your criteria is if I'm going to post about somebody else or I'm going to share information I think might be personal, I'm going to ask for permission about that or I just won't post it at all. Uh, another thing you might find is what your rule might be might not be the same that somebody else applies to themselves. So you need to be careful and consider the courtesies of another. What else do you put in place? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if I would never approach you and say that, then why would I do this online? And I think it works this way too, and we'll get to this a little later on. But if Christ tells me, if my brother sinned against me, Matthew chapter 18, what am I supposed to do with my brother? I go to him, right? I go to him, okay? Well, why do we think, uh, I think for whatever reason, we think we can go online and it's easier to approach somebody in a direct message then maybe it is in person. And we never can accomplish anything through that direct message. We never can, right? Um, yeah. One more, and then I'm going to change the question a little bit. All right? I'm going to ask the question a different way this time. Parents. And this is not to critique you, because you've got wisdom to share me, okay? Share with me, because I need it. Um, what guidelines have you put in place what rules have you put in place with your children as they've engaged with social media? Don't be scared to share it. Please share it. I need to know. He's two and he gets a Facebook next week. Just kidding. Not really. <laughs> yes. What you got? So I was going to say, it applies to the last one too. You know, this is kind of just a, I guess it goes to just a smart thing, but maybe good stewardship as well. We talk about it in my house a whole lot of times for all of us is anything you post is, Mm -hmm. And so, what you post when you're 16 years old, you you know, you may think it's harmless, but when you're 21 and getting a, you know, one out for a job, that's there somewhere, and things can come back to haunt you. And so, you know, you got to be careful with anything you put. It's not going away; you're there permanently. You know, you decide what the moral application is in terms of just you know, your good citizenship and being a good steward for your future. That's pretty important. So, this is one of my points, but you are absolutely right, and it does hit the point of stewardship. I kid you not, I, we did ministry fairs in college where we would do summer internships with different colleges. And I would apply to, it was like you would, there were a dozen or, or 20 or 30 churches that were there looking for youth interns. And you could sign up to, up to seven churches and go around and visit. And I signed up for as many as I could get in in a single day. And one of the churches that I had signed up for went to every youth intern they were looking at and pulled all their social media accounts and ask them about them, okay? Now, that's an employer. But what he's wanting to see, and this is really crazy, they seen me, and they've talked to me and what I believe, but they wanted to see who I really was. And where did they go to see who I really was? Social media. Now, and this is really, as a minister, this is hard. People will act one way in church sometimes, and they'll act a different way on social media. Hey, if you want to know how your teenagers act, like, yeah, okay, See them at church, but go to social media, and then you'll see it. Hey, and by the way, did you know teenagers set up multiple accounts on multiple websites so that they've got one public account that you can see, and they'll add grandma to, and people they want public, and then like a private account that other people can't see because they don't want people to know about it? That's scary. That's spooky, but that happens. 
Also, they have this thing called Snapchat, and what it allows to happen is for your teenagers or whoever to send a picture, and then it disappears after a certain period of time. Why would social media want your kids to have that? Well, right? Um, so that you can't monitor it. Um, all right. Here's what I want you to see. That's got wheels. Jonathan might need, need wheels. Uh, or, or I'm moving. I'm just going to not lean on that. Uh, <laughs> There are, there is no one right answer. This is the way you do it. This is the way you do it. And oftentimes, what I have found as I've taught this very class is that there, I usually get more responses to this is the way I've done it with my children because that's when the rubber meets the road and we've got to figure this thing out. And it's so helpful to me as I'm navigating and figuring it out about how I'll do it too. I always said I would never let them have a tablet because. Because, man, the kids get on the tablet, and they don't know how to talk to you, but they know how to work a computer. And now I've got a toddler, and he has a tablet because I just want to survive, you know? And, uh, and, and it helps to, going into it, have a support system of brothers and sisters in Christ around you to help you figure out through the Word how we should navigate this as parents, Okay. So don't be afraid to share with one another. And, and younger folks tonight, or kids with, you help me in this class. Help me figure it out. Okay, so this is the way the class is going to work tonight. I went online and got these bullet points off of a blog. Not a Christian blog, just a blog, okay? And the blog is giving points to remember about social media. Here's the job that I need from you. I want you to match these guidelines for social media two passages in the Bible, okay? So take what I'm going to say, pour it through the Bible, and give me what comes out on the other side. One of you, you already said it. You said, well, that reminds me of stewardship. So great. Show me those passages that correlate to the points that are given. So this is worldly wisdom, but I think the guidelines that they put are, are some pretty good ones. Here you go. Here's the first one. Use digital communication. Oh, no, 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 no. Pause. Pause. Uh, I want to make the case to people that don't use social media real quick about why you should care about this class and why it matters, okay? Uh, not you in particular, Phil, but you were an example. Uh, it matters. I want you to look at Acts 17, okay? <clears throat> look at me to Acts chapter 17. And start in, well, just start in verse 2. Then Paul, as was his custom, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Okay, pause here. Where was Paul going into, as was his custom, that I didn't read in verse 1? Where was he going to? When he entered into a new city to do ministry and tried to evangelize that community here at Thessalonica, where would he always go first? Synagogue. He would go to the synagogue. Well, pause here now for a second. I want you to think about this. Paul is the apostle to who? The Gentiles, right? Well, then why did he start off by going to the synagogue? What was it? Well, because that's where people with a background about Jesus gathered. So he's like, if I'm going to get a foothold in the city, I very strategically aim for something in particular. There's a large group of people gathering. They're meeting in synagogues, and they have a background about, about this Messiah that would one day come. Here's a good place to start. It's where people are gathered, right? And then later on, look down at chapter 17 and verse... Start in verse 17. 17, 17. He reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews. He's in Athens now, so he starts off in the same way. And with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and they said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Oropagus saying, May we know this new doctrine of which it is that you speak. So, Paul encounters three different locations here. What three places does he go to in Athens? The synagogue. Then where? 
the marketplace, and then he was brought where? Mars Hill. He was brought to the Oropagus, right? So Paul is going to what? It's a strategy. He's going to population center. What do you got? Sorry. Places where people are. Okay. From the ages of 19, and I looked this up on Pew Research, Paul, and I had a slide, and I didn't get my slides up because I needed to do better. Uh, but from like ages of 18 to 25, um, over 85% of people in that age bracket are in, engaged on social media. And over 50% of all people in the entire world, of all, I don't know, 8 billion, however many people there are, over half of them are on social media today. That is crazy. In other words, if you want to engage people, where do you go to engage them? You go to social media. When I move to a new city, guess where I go to figure out about what this place is like before I get here? I went to Facebook, and I looked for groups that were meeting in areas that were nearby, and I looked to see, like, what's happening in Amory, Mississippi. Not a whole lot, but, like, it's there, right? And, and I went, and I went to see what was going on there. And, and I'm using these places to connect with people, and I've added you guys to social media. So you're going to start getting friend requests from me, and, and you'll see that. And I'm following our mutual friends to add people that we have in common. And it is not just a place that I go to. It's the network I connect to, okay? By the way, guess where people are dating now? Social media. There is an app, and I cannot remember the name of the app, but the purpose of the app is to free and revolutionize dating for women. Because usually, who's the one that chases in the relationship? And it has always been this way, I suppose. Men. So the, the, the way that this app works is the only person that has the right to contact the other person is women. And it frees them to approach. It also lets men who are too scared to approach be approached. Um, well, that's interesting, isn't it? They're revolutionizing dating through these social media platforms. So if you're thinking about, well, Jonathan, this class doesn't matter to me, and I don't need to listen to it because it, I don't need to know anything about social media. Listen, it's where people go to get news. I don't, I, didn't, I never subscribed to the newspaper, but I figure out the news. I don't watch the news. It's so depressing, but I watch YouTube. Like, we entertain ourselves on it, does any, if you've got an iPhone, raise your hand. You know on Sunday morning before you come to church and worship God, you get a notification on your phone before you come to worship and it says how much screen time you've had? You know what I'm talking about? And you know when you look and it says you've averaged six hours per day, you worship an idol, right? It's scary. Uh, but everything you do is on there. It is interesting to see your screen time, right? Here's what I want you to see. Don't toss away a class on social media because you do not do, use it. Realize that it's a sphere in which people are meeting in. Essentially, it is the marketplace. It's the same place Paul was going in Acts chapter 17. He was going to Facebook and figuring out what was going in Athens and talking to people there. That's where he went to do it. And if we want to engage with the community around us, we'll more and more have to have this connection in order to be able to reach people that are there and that's why we need a class on it. Um, all right, so back to this blog. Here's the first guideline that they've given. Number one, use digital communication for information, but not for emotions. Use digital communication for information, but not for emotions. 7% of communication, of inter interpersonal communication is verbal. The remainder is nonverbal. And we know this, right? Um, I love you. Oh, I love you, right? Same words, completely different thing. But when we message, can you tell the difference in fluctuation? Oftentimes you can't. You really can't. Maybe with an emoji on the end, but it's harder to see that communication. 93% of your digital communication is hidden and is therefore easy to misinterpret. If your message has emotion behind it, then you need to go to somebody Pick up a phone and call, okay? So, um, what are passages that correlate to that idea? Use digital communication for information, but not for emotions. Any ideas? Charles? 
depend on her. She's my only one. I lean on her definitely. That's right. Absolutely. Any others? What about in the, in the context of, of uh, argument or disagreement? And we talked about this a second ago, where tensions and emotions are flaring. Um, how might responding over the digital platform be negative and instead you should go to talk to somebody in person? A soft answer turns away anger. That's a good passage to use for this. It's difficult to communicate that over social media. There is a layer of communication that is hard to hit over the thumb. It just is. And, and by the way, going to talk to you personally communicates importance to me. It really does. So, um, have you ever got on a forum or got frustrated by somebody on social media and wrote to them a direct message trying to correct them? Have you ever done that before? Any, just me? Okay. Just me. Okay, great. Well, let me tell you how it goes if you've never done it before. Uh, it goes horribly. And, and inevitably, it frustrates people. And I've, I've done it to both sides of an argument because I thought both attitudes were wrong in Christ, and it goes negatively on both sides because what I needed to do was go talk to my brothers in Christ. And it goes better every single time. All right. Um, Galatians chapter 6. Turn there. Galatians chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. There's something involved in going to a brother and telling him that you're worried about him. And what is involved in that according to chapter 6 and verse 1? We need to consider who needs to go. So you need to be asking yourself, am I the person that needs to go? Um, And you need to consider who else? Yourself. Yourself. And one of the best ways to consider yourself is to consider yourself through prayer. So you pray. (laughs) And you're like, God, help me to go in the way that I should go. Help me to have the right spirit in going. Help me to be the person that needs to go to my brother and help me to approach my brother. And instead, oftentimes when we go through social media, you can go quickly, or you can make a rash decision, or you can lash out when you think it needs to be done, and it's not helpful in any way to another. Here's the second point. What you got, Brother Phil? I was just going to say, uh, another uh, uh, word that comes to my mind is season your Yeah, it is very difficult to season speech with the thumb. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's a whole lot easier to communicate verbally when you do that. Um, And just going, like you said earlier, going communicates worth and value and already gets you standing in the right direction. What else? Is there something else you wanted to say? Gotcha. All right, number two. Remember that social media is an aspect of meaningful community, not a replacement for meaningful community. It is an aspect of meaningful community, but not a replacement for meaningful community. Social media is a tool, right? It's something to be used by people, but it is not the place that you can live. What passages are like that in Scripture? What teaches the same thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Acts chapter 2, the church was meeting with each other daily, and it, and it wasn't because they had to meet with one another. You know, one of, the, one of the things that happens when you try to convince somebody that you should, like, go to church on Wednesday night. It would be really good for you and your family to be involved with that. And 
one of the arguments that I hear I've heard is, well, like, Scripture doesn't tell me that I have to, and, like, the elders have come up with that rule. Uh, but the elders came up with the rule because it's helpful for you, right? Well, in Acts chapter 2, why were they meeting daily? Did they have to meet daily? Were they told by the apostles that they needed to be meeting daily? Why were they doing it? Well, I wanted to. They enjoyed to be with each other, and it fulfilled them. They were a part of this new thing, and it was this thing that they found that gave them life, and it was their family, and they were from all different parts of the world, and on Pentecost, they became family with these people they had never met in their life, and they couldn't wait to be with them again. And now here we are complaining about having to meet on Wednesday night again, and it's like, what happened to Acts 2? Acts 2, 42 through 47. The perfect church, that thing we strive to want to be. And preachers are like, please come to church. <laughs> they didn't they know all they needed to know, and that was, they was getting this information as they met. Yeah. So one of the things that they were devoted to was the apostles' teaching, and they were growing in it all the time, and they loved it. Absolutely. Uh, what else? Well, the classic passage is Hebrews chapter 10, 25, and we beat it to death, but I'm going I'm to beat it one more time. Uh, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You can't hug somebody on Facebook. They try really hard. There's an emoji now. It's called the care emoji, and it looks like a little smiley face hugging you. Uh, but it ain't the same thing. It just is not the same thing. All right. Show respect even to those who don't deserve it, not as a re reflection of their character, but as a reflection of yours. Show respect to those who don't deserve it, not as a reflection of their character, but as a re reflection of yours. A lot of people use social media to create drama and public forums for arguments. Uh, we should fight the temptation of being pulled into that negativity. People should be able to look at a string of comments and see where the Christian stands out because blessed are the peacemakers, right? And yet oftentimes, a lot of the vitriol and anger comes right from our, from our fingertips, it's like, no, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't match with the character of what you proclaim at all. Yes, sir. Okay, what's it say? Or everybody can't hear you. You mean to read it? Yes. Second Timothy 2, what? Avoid foolish... Yeah, this is good. In ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and so that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by his will to do his will. I think that's a perfect summary. I think that's absolutely perfect. Yeah. Um, we lose the ability to speak when we lose the ability to add salt to our language. And here we are pouring, I don't know, Tabasco sauce, not salt. It's salty, but just all over that, and it's stirring up strife where nothing is. And have you heard or just noticed that when you stir up strife, people can't even hear the thing that you're saying anymore anyway. I mean, they cannot process it because you've stepped over and proven that you don't care about them or where they're coming from, right? We have the inability to reason or listen when we're typing away and don't in that way. So, perfect. All right, here's the next one. Remember that the world is your audience. The world is your audience, okay? So you post something because Jim Bob that goes to church with you posts something and you disagree with it and you post underneath this comment. Well, guess what can happen to that comment that you posted? It can be shared all over the place. Hey, here's another thing that needs to be considered. You know how sometimes churches, when they disfellowship somebody, oh, and this, oh, I, it's so harmful. Uh, but they disfellowship somebody, and I'm not saying that sometimes that doesn't need to happen. 
But the purpose of doing the disfellowshipping, which is the ultimate severing, like of a relationship, like one of the harshest things that you have to do sometime in the most extreme of circumstances, the purpose of that is to do what? To win a brother back. So, but instead, what I've seen posted on Facebook is they'll write whoever a letter, put it in the mail, and mail it to them. And then they'll take a picture of it, and they will post it to social media, and they'll call us Church of Christ people a crazy cult, and then it gets shared all over the world. And I swear we look like a crazy cult. I mean, that's exactly what we look like. Because we're, we're not, it's not for the purpose of restoring a brother. It's just informing you you're out, Right? And you got to go and have that conversation. Um, people keep those notes, don't they? And people can share a picture. People can also share the way that you talk, which leads into the next point. Remember the permanence of digital, which is what you said a minute ago. Remember the permanence of digital. It never, ever goes away. It never, ever goes away. So the comments that you made that were silly back then come back to you. Do you remember Time Hop when that was really popular? Facebook absorbed it, but Time Hop showed you pictures that you made on this day a decade ago, and uh, that's always cringy to me because a decade ago, uh, I was dating Madison and not married to her yet, and uh, everything she did was adorable and sweet and cute, and that's still true, but you just, yeah, yeah, uh, it's just, uh, it's just squirmy, you know, how much you share because you love each other so much, right? Well, Okay, but negatively, imagine you looking back at a post you made 10 years ago about whatever political position you had when you were, like, back in the 70s, right? You know, you felt one way politically back in the 70s, and, you know, it's 2023, and I feel a little bit different now, and you look back at what you posted then, and you're like, oh, or you look back at the picture of what you wore back in the 70s, and you see that afro, and you see those pants that are way out here, and you're like, oh, but imagine you doing that with your attitude that's negative and poor, okay? Okay. Scripture reminds us, we sometimes have entertained angels without ever knowing it, right? So it makes me wonder if like angels are on Facebook or on Snapchat or on Twitter looking at the things that we've posted. We just need to be mindful of these things. And last, uh, and this one's from me. Whatever you do, Colossians 3.17, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. We do not have permission to simply stop doing Colossians 3.17 because we stopped talking to an individual and have started talking to somebody digitally, okay? Our principles of language, our principles of dialogue, our principles of communication, and our principles of relationship, our principles of confrontation that have been changed and shaped by Jesus do not fly out the window because now we're on a digital platform, are they? So, remember... Take what Christ has shown you, use it in the digital sphere, and apply it there. All right. These are starting points for a covenant about how we treat each other in the digital age. We will pause. Does anybody have anything they want to add to this? Maybe some rules you thought about. Yes, sir. You know when you're talking to somebody in person, do you know when it's really easy to hold back your anger and frustration? When they look like they play football for the NFL and they weigh 360 pounds and they're ripped, right? And suddenly, when we go digitally, you are equal to everybody else's size. And it makes you wonder... Uh, how, like not wise people are, but how much of the people that are in front of them. Uh, We show our true wisdom by being equal with everybody, and we recognize this all the time. 
and choosing to be silent when we could show anger, right? Okay, one more, and then class has already got to be over. So yes, sir, and this is it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and you're going to be judged by those things, right? Uh, your great grandfather won't have his Facebook feed brought to him at Judgment Day. But like, all right, that's it. Thank you. What Bible version are you using? I tonight I'm using the uh, the New King James version, but I. Submission, perfect delight, visions of wrath above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is Savior all the day long, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior.